to the Evidence-Based Strategy Series, Guiding the Targeted Improvement Plan Process. My name is Brooke Gabers, and I'm the Nebraska MTSS Region 3 Support Lead. My name is Chris Kampovitz, the NEMTSS Region 4 Support Lead. And my name is Kayla Payton. I am the NEMTSS Region 2 Support Lead. The Nebraska Multi-Tiered System of Support Team, in collaboration with the Nebraska Department of Education Office of Special Education, has created webinars to guide the implementation of the evidence-based strategies identified in the Targeted Improvement Plan. Since we know that students that are identified as needing special education support deserve to be in the general education classrooms first and foremost, these webinars should be used to support district and school-wide continuous improvement efforts. As part of the series, there are four crash course webinars that will focus on each of the evidence-based strategies, one staff rollout webinar, four classroom implementation webinars, and a database decision-making webinar. The purpose of this webinar series is to enhance the implementation of evidence-based strategies with a focus on tier one core support within an MTSS framework and is applicable to all classrooms. Welcome to the crash course on flexible grouping as part one of the series. Throughout this webinar, we will recognize how the Targeted Improvement Plan, or the TIP, is a part of a multi-tiered system of support, or MTSS framework. We'll define flexible grouping as an evidence-based strategy at the Tier 1 core level, and we will identify examples of flexible grouping for Tier 1 core instruction at the elementary, middle, and high school levels. So first, let's identify what the TIP looks like within an MTSS framework. In 2014, the U.S. Department of Education's Office of Special Education Programs, also known as OSEP, revised its accountability system to shift the balance from a system focused primarily on compliance to one that puts more emphasis on results. This new accountability framework for special education is intended to improve learning for students with disabilities. Each state is required to develop a state systemic improvement plan, known as the SIP, to identify gaps in student performance, analyze state systems, and then implement targeted evidence-based reforms to address the gaps. In 2015, NDE's Office of Special Education, with stakeholder input, identified MTSS as a sound, logical, and coherent strategy that is aligned with the state-identified measurable result, which is known as the SIMR. Nebraska then developed a new multi-tiered system of support framework in 2016 that was intended to be a systematic and integrated approach to continuous improvement and an evidence-based model of providing instruction and intervention supports to all students based on academic, social, emotional, and behavioral needs identified through data. This framework is known as Nebraska MTSS, which integrates PBIS into the RTI model and also includes early childhood pyramid and social emotional behavioral learning. Then in 2019, NDE's Office of Special Education established the focus of the State Systemic Improvement Plan or that ESIP to be to increase the use of evidence-based practices, also known as EBPs across the state by providing support for districts targeted improvement plans, which are known as the TIP. This includes data analysis, selection of evidence-based practices, and implementation of the evidence-based practices to fidelity. The goal of those targeted improvement plans, or the TIP, is to improve learning and educational outcomes for students with disabilities. Data shows that the majority of students with disabilities in the state of Nebraska spend the bulk of their day in the general education classroom. Because of that, the selected evidence-based strategy is intended to be used at the tier one core level in the general education classroom. Research tells us that the best way to improve outcomes for students with disabilities is by improving education for all students. In order to ensure that each student has access to those evidence-based practices or EBPs as required by the TIP, we need to build structures and systems that allow for inclusive practices to ensure that each student has access to the core practices. There is clear and consistent evidence that inclusive educational settings can confer substantial short and long-term benefits for students with and without disabilities. What we know is this can occur through a well-developed MTSS framework. As we consider implementing that multi-tiered system of support, we recognize that MTSS is the system to organize the practices that we, the adults, provide to all students. 
This includes first ensuring that we are using high quality instructional materials in classrooms. We also use data so that we can identify students in need of additional support early on. This requires that all educators and stakeholders engage in a problem solving process to determine the appropriate academic, social, emotional, and behavioral support for each learner. Remember, MTSS is how we organize the supports we provide for students. We identify those supports through a layered continuum that recognizes what we do for all students, for some students, and for a few students. We know that by establishing our tier one supports through effective instruction and high quality instructional materials, the majority of our students, or about 75 to 80% of them, will be successful. Once we are implementing our tier one practices effectively, we can accurately identify those in further need of assistance. If less than 75 to 80% of our students are proficient, however, it's essential to intensify our focus on improving tier one core practices. So as we consider our tier one efforts, we must continue to evaluate and strengthen our key foundational components that we know support all students in a safe, welcoming and predictable environment. Through preventative and proactive approaches, we can provide social, emotional, behavioral, and academic support for all students while building positive relationships. Through processes such as the targeted improvement plan, we can focus on the fidelity of implementing evidence-based practices such as flexible grouping by establishing a supportive atmosphere. What is flexible grouping? Flexible grouping is a strategy that is data-driven. It's fluid, meaning it's able to be changed when and as needed. It also targets to the needs of each student. It's highly structured in requiring intentional planning and with clear, concise directives for students. It provides an appropriate setting to accomplish the goals of the lesson and best used alongside other evidence-based practices. Flexible grouping facilitates the potential for differentiation of instruction or tailoring the instruction to meet the individual needs of students. It allows for the intensification of the supports students receive, as well as the individualization of instruction that might be necessary for each student based on data, the goals of the lesson, and student performance. A disclaimer, flexible grouping is not it's not just based on ability level. It is not just used to practice a skill. It can also be used for inquiry-based learning or cooperative learning. It is not one size fits all. What may work for one class or grade may not work for another class or grade. It is not just for academics. Flexible grouping can be also used for social skills groups, for example, a group of students struggling with responsible decision-making meet during wind time to work on strengthening the SCBL skill. And it's not just teacher-led. Flexible grouping allows for the following benefits. It honors the learner variability. It supports accelerated learning. It addresses foundational skills that students may still need to acquire. It increases student engagement by meeting their needs in a variety of ways. It provides just-in-time, in-depth academic interactions with peers and adults throughout class time. It fosters an inclusion and collaborative environment amongst all students. Flexible grouping also supports schools in strengthening skills within each of the five competencies from CASEL, the Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning as well as supporting college, career, community readiness. It increases social awareness and relationship skills, and in a moment, we'll identify how flexible grouping also helps students develop important employability skills. Finally, it encourages communication, critical thinking, and problem-solving skills essential to developing deep understanding of their learning. This table from CASEL, the Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning, really outlines each of the five SEBL competencies mentioned earlier. It also outlines some of the in-demand employee skills that employers are truly looking for, like time management, flexibility, conflict resolution, and the ability to collaborate. 
There have been several studies showing that SEBL skills are among the top skills employers want and look for in potential employees. And these really are the skills that each of us as educators want our students to learn. And it's our goal to help our students be become college, career, and community ready. When students are given the opportunity to learn and practice the SEBL competencies and skills in a variety of activities regularly, they are better able to recognize and apply those skills when they are needed across different environments and throughout their lifespan. Flexible grouping can foster a lot of these opportunities for students. Reimagining and emerging occupations require employees to have social and collaborative skills that cannot be replicated by technology. And while technology continues to grow, those SEBL competencies and employability skills are irreplaceable. Flexible grouping promotes social and collaborative situations and experiences for all students that will help them navigate the workplace later in life. Pause this recording of the webinar to reflect independently or with your team different ways flexible grouping can support students in developing social, emotional, behavioral, and employability skills. Now that we have an understanding and definition of flexible grouping, let's now take a look at the different types and configurations. Flexible grouping can be either teacher selected or student selected. Teachers may form flexible groups based on readiness levels, personal interests, interests often indicate motivation to learn and participate rather than likes. Teachers may form flexible groups based on learning profiles, which leads to efficiency in learning and reflection style, like internalizing and externalizing. Students may form flexible groups based on learner preference, which means I prefer to do a podcast rather than write a paper, or I prefer to read one part of an article while my partner reads the other, or students may form flexible groups based on personal interests. In addition, flexible groups may be long term or short term. For example, a seating chart may consist of a four student flexible group. This seating arrangement may stand for up to nine weeks. An example of a short-term flexible group would be to include an expert group or a quick partner share. Again, just to emphasize, readiness level is how prepared students are to learn new content to bridge gaps in learning, or otherwise known as the zone of proximal development. An example of grouping methods is to ask students to fill out a learner profile card similar to what is shown on the screen. This profile card can capture students' personal interests and academic interests, their learning preferences, and how students prefer to reflect on their learning. Flexible groups can be formed intentionally or randomly. As they arrive in class, students can be assigned a number, draw a card, or pick a popsicle stick. Teachers can engage students in a four corners activity where students pick or identify with something in a specific corner of the room. This could be posed as a would you rather question, a personal interest question, or picking a personal favorite. This method can also be used for taking a stance on a topic students have read about, the way students solve a problem, or so forth. Students can also be assigned a partner group or a group utilizing the inside outside circle method, where half of the class is on the inside and half of the class is on the outside circle. The teacher will instruct either or both circles to move, randomly stopping and asking students to discuss a question or a certain topic. A hallmark for creating effective groups is the teacher making the decision to change grouping patterns depending on lesson goals and objectives and may include homogeneous and or heterogeneous small groups, pairs of students, whole class, or the need for individualized instruction as denoted by a student's IEP. These decisions should be driven by the intersection of data on student performance and the content being taught. To, to configure flexible groups, student selections can be guided by student performance on assessment data, such as progress monitoring measures, student growth measures, and formative and summative assessment data. 
Both homogeneous and heterogeneous groups can be formed by examining similarities and differences in interest and social, emotional, behavioral awareness, readiness, and needs. We want to give you the opportunity to pause and reflect about the information we just covered. After reading the following scenario, identify areas of strength and areas of growth based on Mr. Smith's use of flexible grouping. When you're ready, pause the recording of this webinar to read and reflect independently or with your team on areas of strength and areas of growth for Mr. Smith based on his current grouping practices. A few things to note that are areas of strength for Mr. Smith is that he uses assessment evidence to form and adjust groups. It's important to examine classroom data when determining appropriate instructional practices, including those around grouping. One area of growth for Mr. Smith is that his students are placed in groups that reflect only a single dimension of who they are and how they learn. He should consider using other data points or grouping methods at times as well. Next, we have heterogeneous and homogeneous grouping. Heterogeneous grouping by definition means diverse or dissimilar elements. When considering grouping, this means a diverse group of students working together. This type of grouping can serve multiple instructional purposes and allows all students to be engaged in grade level content related discussions and improves interpersonal skills for students. Heterogeneous grouping can be based on a variety of factors. Likewise, homogeneous grouping, meaning groups made up of students who have similar needs, strengths, or interests are working together. The more intensive the instruction needs to be, the smaller these groups should be. We also know that there are teacher-led and student-led groups. Teacher-led groups are grouping structures where communication is typically flowing between teacher and student, rather than from student to student. Teacher-led groups provide an effective and efficient way of introducing material, and they also pair well with explicit instruction. They can also meet the common needs of a large or a small group and can provide opportunities for individual attention or instruction. One example of teacher-led grouping is whole group instruction, whether it's used to introduce new concepts, build common experiences, or provide a shared basis for further exploration, problem solving, and skill development. Another example is small group instruction. Sometimes small group instruction is used to provide an opportunity to work with students who have similar needs, whether it's for enrichment or reinforcement. Likewise, in student-led groups, students control the group dynamics and maintain a voice in the process. They also provide opportunities for divergent thinking where many solutions to a problem are proposed and can be used to facilitate inquiry-based learning. It also encourages students to take responsibility for their own learning. Another benefit of student-led groups is that they model real-life adult situations in which people work together, not in isolation, to solve problems. Students working in groups learn to work with people from varying backgrounds and with different experiences, sharpening social, emotional, and behavioral skills. Through this, student confidence is enhanced. Some examples of student-led groups are collaborative groups where students work as a team to problem-solve together, performance-based groups, or pairs. Take the time to read the following scenario and then identify areas of strength and areas of growth for Ms. Williams based on her current grouping practices. When you're ready, pause the recording of this webinar to reflect independently or with your team on those areas of strength and areas of growth for Ms. Williams. One area of strength for Ms. Williams is that she consistently uses small group work to provide opportunities for student discourse and fosters the expectation of, the cl of collaboration. However, an area for growth for Ms. Williams is that the labeling of students as high achieving, low achieving, or average is inaccurate and flattens students into one-dimensional identities. Beyond that, this grouping reflects a perception of ability rather than targeting a student's readiness level with the intent of growth. It's also important to recognize that no student has every answer every day. Likewise, no student needs help to solve every problem. 
Recognizing and responding to the truth that each student possesses both areas of strength and areas for growth is an important first step to moving everyone forward in their learning and doing so in a respectful way. There are lots of variations of flexible grouping, whether you're looking for an intentional teacher-led heterogeneous group or a random homogeneous student-led group. Four corners is one of those great ways to quickly group students by interest or to have students break into groups to solve different parts of a problem by selecting a choice in one of the four corners of a room. Socratic seminars allow older students to engage in discussions around an open-ended question or prompt in a formal way. The jigsaw grouping method is a cooperative learning strategy where students in home groups become experts, then in their jigsaw group, each expert shares their part to teach their peers. In project-based learning groups, students work on a project over an extended period of time that engages them in solving a real-world problem or answering a complex question. They then demonstrate their knowledge and skills by creating a public product or presentation for a real audience. Similarly, inquiry-based learning is where a group of students seek knowledge through questioning, like in a science lab. Finally, the fishbowl method is where students take turns being in a small group being in a small group, forming an inner circle inside the fishbowl, discussing a question while the outer circle of students is observing. There are links to resources to support you in facilitating all of the variations of flexible grouping on this slide. Before implementing flexible groups, a, fourth, a few things you may want to consider. Thinking through the implementation of flexible groups will lead to more efficient and effective learning. For students to be able to work and learn efficiently and effectively within a flexible group, we need to first meet the hierarchy of needs as stated by Maslow. They need to feel safe, accepted, and know that they have the support of peers and adults before they can embark on their discovery and learning through the classroom activities you have designed with Bloom's taxonomy in mind. This can be achieved by intentionally fostering community and building trust within your classroom. Using flexible groups without regard for how instruction will be provided will not result in the desired learning gains. Being proactive and ensuring structure within flexible groups is a must in order to avoid chaos and dysfunction. Explicitly teaching routines and expectations. Ensure all students understand what is expected, what routines and procedures look and sound like, and ensure students know specific goals or the purpose of the tasks assigned to them. Give clear and concise directions for students to follow throughout their work. Again, thinking through these components will lead to a structured learning environment that will benefit each student. As the teacher, ensure you are using explicit strategies to maximize and equalize student opportunities to respond. Ensure all students, whether the quiet ones or those that are more outspoken, all have opportunities to share their thoughts, ideas, questions, or concerns, and then provide positive and constructive feedback to keep their learning on trajectory. Provide support and also nudges in their thinking to move forward without doing the work for them. For additional information on opportunities to respond, check out our explicit instruction webinar. And for more support on feedback, visit our crash course on positive and constructive feedback. As noted in the previous slides, ensuring you are proactive in thinking through the details for flexible grouping is necessary. This table shows possible considerations of both the academic skills and the social and emotional skills within the student characteristic box. Utilizing these types of considerations as you begin planning for groups can be helpful. You can use the link on the side to access this flexible grouping planning tool. There is a lot to consider when planning for flexible grouping to ensure you are me meeting the academic social, emotional, and behavioral needs of all your students. Sometimes it's helpful to consider student personalities and aim for a balance of introverted and extroverted personalities in the different groups. You may also consider building in time for an icebreaker to foster community within each group. 
By activating prior knowledge at the beginning of the activity, you might be able to boost student confidence and prevent and reduce behaviors that may have occurred during the activity. Throughout each step of the activity, it is good to check for understanding at each step to ensure students understand the expectations. Assigning roles to students at the beginning of the activity can be helpful in reducing social anxiety. Consider roles like a reader, recorder, and a facilitator. You can also use sentence stems to help students with discussions or written responses. Finally, at the end of your activity, it is good to seek the feedback from the students. Consider using technology like a Jamboard or a Google Doc or Mentimeter to ask how the learning experiences was for them and how it could improve for the next time. These considerations may differ depending on the goal of the lesson, the students in the class, or even the content of the class. Again, these are just considerations and may not be applicable, applicable at all times and by all teachers, but are good to think about to meet the needs of all the learners. Pause the recording and discuss with your team one or two ways you will incorporate flexible grouping. Or if you are in a leadership role, what are one or two ways you will promote flexible grouping in your building? To review throughout this webinar, we accomplished the following. We recognize how the Targeted Improvement Plan, or TIP, is a part of a multi-tiered system of support framework. We define flexible grouping as an evidence-based practice at the Tier 1 core level, and we identified flexible grouping examples for Tier 1 core instruction at the elementary, middle, and high school levels. As we conclude, we want to thank you for taking time to learn more about flexible grouping. As a reminder, this is just one webinar as part of a series. If you would like to learn more about the other three evidence-based strategies identified in the Targeted Improvement Plan, you can view a crash course webinar for each of those three. If you would like to know, learn more about implementing any of the four evidence-based strategies, we have a webinar titled Staff Rollout to assist in those efforts. Once you have had the opportunity to strategically roll out the evidence-based strategy, there are webinars titled Classroom Implementation that will assist in guiding implementation for each strategy. After classroom implementation is established, teams can view the final webinar of the series titled Database Decision-Making to assist in the use of assessment and fidelity data in order to improve outcomes for all students. Please visit the NEMTSS website at nemtss.unl.edu to view all of the webinars, as well as find the information needed to contact your regional support lead to address any questions you might have. Thank you, and we hope you have a wonderful day.